I think when we talk about science and religion, we, we often deal as we necessarily have to, I suppose, in fairly crude terms. And we think we've got a good understanding of what science is and, and what religion is. But actually, when you look in more detail, even at individual thinkers, the issue is, is often quite complicated. If you take the case of Isaac Newton, for example, uh, we have somebody who is uh, the founder of Enlightenment reason, if you like. His great triumphs in the Principia and in his optics are taken to be the, the major texts of the Enlightenment. They're, they're what people take to show that human beings have got uh, a reasoning power that's adequate to the natural world. And for some people in the 19th century, and certainly in the 20th century, uh, Newton showed that you had no need of the hypothesis of God. However, Newton himself is a deeply devout and radical original Christian thinker. He's not a member of any church, um, he's, not, he's certainly not a minister in a church, but he's somebody who spends virtually all of his life in this extraordinary quest to understand how Christianity had, in his eyes, come to be corrupted. He's somebody who uh, certainly believes in natural theology. Um, he believes that his own role as a natural philosopher is a, is a religious role. Um, he believes that doing natural philosophy is reading the book of God. Um, but he's somebody who, who does a lot more than that. He spends most of his time and he devotes his life to doing theology. He's somebody who believes he's one of the elect. He's specially chosen by God. He will reign with Christ in the millennium. So he thinks he's a very special boy. And that, that kind of self-belief, that, that radical, immense self-belief, energizes the originality of his work in mathematics, physics, and theology itself. What's interesting about Newton is precisely that while he's alive, his, his deep religiosity and his, his thorough awareness of theology has to be covered up. It's covered up by himself, and it's covered up by the one or two people who know the true nature of his heresies. So Newton uh, privately is a man who writes millions and millions of words on theology, on the apocalypse, on the whore of Babylon, the woman in the wilderness, the two-horned and ten-horned beasts. But publicly he's somebody who doesn't seem to be that religious. Uh, he doesn't seem to be that devout. And that, that view of Newton is quite clear in the 18th century. It's only in the 19th century, in the 20th century, that we've come to understand the deep relig religiosity that Newton had, this, this immense undertaking that he did for many hours and each day of his life of studying the Bible. Now, where you get a, a further paradox, I think, is in, the, in what happened to Newton in the, the more uh, radical arenas of the Enlightenment, because there were a number of people, particularly in France, who believed that Newton's achievements in science were so great that he was worthy of being worshipped, that uh, in the eyes of one of his followers, uh, Etienne Louis Boulet, that it was worth creating a gigantic cenotaph um, that was dedicated to the life and works of Isaac Newton. And some people have laughed at, uh, at Boulet's uh, project. Uh, certainly people in the 18th century in, in Anglican England would have been dismayed by it, even though Newton was, of course, their, their great hero. But what I think it, it shows in, in a sort of prefigurative way is the way in which science can become uh, a form of religion. Um, it, it can, in some aspects, become, it can take on the character of that thing that it sets itself against. And, and what you see in a number of people in the late 18th century and 19th century is a developing anti-religious animus that takes on the character of the very people that they hate. Uh, people become deeply upset that people still believe in religion. Um, they preach the truth of science. They preach the necessity of Newtonian physics and other kinds of physics. And that they take on the, the kind of evangelizing and proselytizing characteristics 
of, of that very practice that they detest so much.